Okay, great. We are recording. MK Fain, welcome back to my podcast. Hi, glad to be back and so soon. Yeah, so um, you had a bit of a day yesterday. I did. It was very exciting. My 15 yeah. minutes of fame. Yeah, um, you're basically a celebrity now. But so what was that like? Did you wake up and see the article? What was, how did it go? Yeah, so I had a lot of work that I was supposed to be doing yesterday, and I had blocked off my little chunks of time. I was going to spend all my tasks, and then I woke up in the morning and checked Discord, and the over at Mods had messaged me, the article's up! And so, you know, of course, immediately that just derailed my entire plan for the day. So I read it before I said anything to anyone. I just sat down and read it and tried not to skim it. And then after that, it was just a constant wave all day. Um, we, I, I would actually say was a major success. We had so much support, so many new members joined, even donors. And then after I released my response to the article, uh, then we really blew up. And I think that it, it was just really exciting. I think honestly, in some ways we couldn't have paid for better B PR if we wanted to. <laughs> Because everyone could just see right through it. <laughs> How did it feel when you were reading the article? Um, well, okay. We were preparing for a hit piece. It was clear going into it with uh, the question, especially the more questions she asked, the more clear it became that we were going to get a hit piece. Um, it was not clear what the exact angle was going to be or how bad it would be for us. And when I was reading it the whole time, I was actually just thinking, wow, this isn't that bad, <laughs> which really? is, yeah, which actually I think says something about, because it was really bad, like everyone else was really shocked and offended on our behalf, and for us it actually was not as bad as we were expecting, which I think says something about the state of media and how much trust we really had in them to do a good job on this piece. Um, I was mostly looking for times that I had been misquoted or times that my views had been misrepresented because I, made, I, I was shocked actually, this was one thing that also caught me off guard was they managed to make the whole thing about me when yeah. it was supposed to be about over it and I had been really trying to direct them to speak more to the over it administrators. And so I, I was surprised how much it was about me. That was actually probably my first response. So who but then, did they talk to? They talked to you and was it two moderators? Yeah, two admins who had been there from the founding of over it, yeah. And then they didn't use a single quote from them, right? No, nothing. They didn't even say that they had spoken to them. Right. Okay, yeah. so Caitlin Tiffany is the author of this piece. And um, we're about to read through the piece and do a sort of a close reading or dissection of it. But what, um, what were your phone calls like? I'm just curious. What was the tone like when you talked? Yeah, so the phone calls were the first communication we had besides her initial email reaching out asking if we could have a call. And those first calls were very cordial, friendly even. Um, I was very anxious, uh, obviously, but she was asking a lot of questions more on the technical side at first. It really seemed like she was trying to understand this uh, the technology that we were using, the decisions that we made about our software. There were a lot of questions around which open source alternatives did we consider using and which didn't and what were the technical aspects of each of those and a lot of stuff that did not make it into the article at all was really this like whole uh, tech free software side of it and so that was actually what most of our first conversation was um, we also talked about my other projects like spinster and I, you know, tried to explain the Fediverse to her and some other technical concepts that I, you know, thought that she would require knowledge of and that but didn't go as well. It was clear she had a pretty rudimentary understanding of technology. Um, for a tech reporter, I was a little surprised. But, you know, so it was just a lot of kind of basic 101 explaining the first call. The second call was actually months later. Our, our first call was... Um, I'm, I'm actually not positive. I think it was maybe in September. And so that was a long time ago now. Yeah. <laughs> and then she dropped off the face of the earth and then got back to us right before the election mm -hmm. and said, hey, as you can imagine, I've been really busy uh, during the election season, but I'd like to pick back up on this article after the election is over. Can we schedule a follow-up call? 
So, uh, okay, sure. So we had that follow-up call after the election, and that time it was a lot more about what are radical feminists, what is gender critical, J.K. Rowling, uh, who are you, and me, and asking you know about my beliefs personally, how I came to these beliefs personally. Um, you know, I told her my story about getting fired, like we talked about on our last podcast together, and so she had a lot of questions around that. Um, and so that was the second phone call. And the tone was always very polite. She seemed curious and professional. Uh, I never really had a problem talking to her beyond just the fact that, you know, I was anxious talking to a reporter. So then she, that's after that call is when began all of the follow-up emails. And that's what I was able to eventually publish. So that's when I would say the tone started to change and it became clear where this was headed. Although to be clear, we were really under no illusions in the beginning, but right. the, yeah, the true tone started to shine through at that point. Yeah. Well, I hope you don't mind me saying, but in one of your messages to me, you said something like you don't mind being dragged through the mud if we, you can get the word out about the issues and I mean, as a lot of people have been saying, your quotes really did shine through regardless of her commentary, but let's get into it now. So I'm going to yeah. turn on screen sharing. Had you ever heard of Caitlin Tiffany before this? No, but you know, I obviously looked her up when I first heard from her. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. The secret internet of TERFs. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe right now this counts. As the secret yeah part, what we're doing right now okay. yeah I mean honestly just that very title so to interject right away I have to say so this title has been changed multiple times you can actually see in the top um, tab where the title is one of the original titles I believe that's probably the first title and they never got around to updating the uh, the metadata of the page to reflect the new title when it was published so you can see that one says something like Turfs and the Donald. I'm not sure what the rest of it reads. And then there was another version of the headline that was something along the lines of the hate groups Reddit band are still around, something like that. And then they eventually landed on the secret internet of Turfs one after it had gone through multiple iterations. And I just have to say, um, this isn't the dark web. Like, <laughs> you can type these URLs in your browser with Google Chrome or whatever you are using, and there's nothing secret about it. In fact, we've been trying to get the word out about our secret internet platforms, and so it really did us a favor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... Subtitle, after they were banned from Reddit, trans exclusionary radical feminists became the latest of many toxic communities to simply build their own platform. All right. Got this nice graphic of like hellfire in the web browser. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mary Kate Payne, a 27 year old engineer and writer living in Houston, has always considered herself a feminist. Okay, anything? Well, I actually that? just noticed. Yeah, yeah, actually, I'm not 27 anymore. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, we were we were 27 or sorry, I was 27 when we first started talking and I'm 28 now. My birthday was in October. I didn't even notice that the first read through, but that's funny. Major glaring error right there in the first like four words. <laughs> All right. Well, happy birthday. Moving on. From Thank that. you. <laughs> um, growing up, she told me she had a pretty standard set of progressive values. Her primary focus was animal rights and her feminism was reflexive mainstream. In college, however, her ideas about feminism shifted. After volunteering at a domestic violence shelter and experiencing an abusive relationship herself, she committed to some of the radical feminist ideology, most often affiliated with the second wave icon Andrea Dworkin, which is focused on the roots and prevalence of male violence. Uh, male violence. Eventually, her beliefs radicalized further. She became convinced that trans women are men and trans rights activism is just another weapon of the patriarchy. Yeah, so we have to talk about that line. <laughs> so I feel a little uncomfortable with a radical on my podcast. Someone has been radicalized <laughs> to such an extent as this. <laughs> yes, you're really giving a platform to a dangerous bigot here. So, <laughs> so we already but, have an asterisk. Yeah, what were you mm -hmm. going to say? 
Yeah, so uh, if you follow that down to the bottom where it links to, you can see that it says that it has been updated to better reflect Bain's beliefs. Um, what this line originally said is, I had been radicalized and convinced that gender is fixed. And that was right there in the first paragraph, this major glaring error that it seems like it must have been intentional because I don't know how she could genuinely think that that's what I think after all of the conversations we have and after doing any research on me. You know, like I've written extensively about gender uh, for years now and my stance on gender is very well established, I would say. Um, that's part of why I'm in trouble, <laughs> right? But I wrote to her, uh, immediately after seeing that and said, can you please correct it to say sex is fixed is what I'm convinced of. And she said that she was in contact with her editor. And then a couple hours later, that part was just removed entirely. And so that was pretty telling to me because they knew that to say I had become convinced that sex was fixed would not appear to be a radical statement in any way. And so to actually put it bluntly like that, they uh, they just had to remove it entirely because they couldn't get away with the lie. And then, so I do appreciate that they corrected it. <laughs> yeah, but then they, ended, they added it back in with, and changed the word gender. Or they didn't. No, I don't think so. That never ended up back in. Nope. No, they just took out that line entirely, I, I believe. I remember that. When you said that, I remembered when I read the article yesterday that was in there. Now it's gone. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I know. All right. Well, there's a lot to say about that. Maybe we want to keep moving for now because we could probably <laughs> go for about an hour about just that one. Yeah, I could do an hour on one of these lines. <laughs> okay. Like many, Fane's political transformation was helped along by the internet. Though she'd never had much use for social media before, on Reddit she found a forum or subreddit where tens of thousands of members, predominantly women, were devoted to the insistence that trans women are not women. I first found the community while I was still looking for answers, Fain said. These women were asking the same questions that she was, going through the same uncomfortable situations with their friends, feeling the same moment of disenchantment. They had experienced the same guilt over breaking with their communities, and now they had one another. That paragraph is actually remarkably accurate. I think that's a good representation of what I went through. Okay, good. So we'll keep it moving. <laughs> Among other online feminists, the common name for this group Fain found is Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminists or TERFs. And I just want to say, I didn't, I don't think this is a journalistic or professional word or term to use. So I'm surprised, uh, well, maybe not surprised, but I don't, I don't think that's a journalistic word. I think it's bizarre that that's in here so many times. Okay, the name yeah. the community has chosen for itself is somewhat more, somewhat more palatable, gender critical, though as other feminists often point out, that name means nothing. All feminism is critical of gender. Do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I do. So the first thing is that she specifically asked me, and this is in our emails, about my response to the term turf and what my specific Okay, uh, let's look at the emails too while you're yeah. explaining that. So I think that it was maybe in the second round of questions. Okay. She, yeah, somewhere, maybe the third round. Sorry, there were a lot. Mm -hmm. well, here it <laughs> says she pointed out that trans inclusion and feminism. Yeah, I, I think specifically about the word turf might actually be in the next round. Okay. No, sorry, the next one. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of emails. So if people there were. don't know, MK released all of the emails that there it is. the two exchanged. Okay, here it is. Yes. So as I said there, my objection to the word turf is because it's not accurate. That's the main objection. I also object to the fact that this term is often used as a way to threaten and intimidate women, especially lesbians, especially uh, feminists. But I really think that it's important to note how inaccurate the term is because, and we talked about this on the phone, she asked me explicitly, uh, do you include females who identify as trans in your feminism? Yes, of course, we include all females in our feminism. Our feminism is for the female sex class, and that includes 
any female, no matter how they identify. And so this term, actually what it does is it erases the reality of trans uh, identified females and basically pretends that they don't exist. All of these young girls and women who are identifying as trans now, because those women are not only included in our feminism, but they've become very much at the, at the forefront of our feminism. And a lot of great work is being done by uh, detransitioners in particular and other young women who are uh, involved very much in the, in the trans identity. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, there may have been some nuance in your answer. Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> if I'm the only one who picked up on that, but okay. Um, TERFs constitute a minority of a minority of feminists, says Grace Lavery, a UC Berkeley literature professor and writer. Oh, thank God they're bringing in an expert, a UC Berkeley professor. I'm sure this is going to shed a lot of light on the situation. Nevertheless, this tiny group has attracted a disproportionate amount of attention in the past several years. In large part, thanks to social media platforms, anti-trans feminists have a presence in many mainstream online spaces, including Twitter, Radfem Tumblr, the Black Women's Beauty Forum, Lipstick Alley, and the British Parenting Forum, Munsnet. <laughs> okay, okay, where do you want to start with? <laughs> I guess let's just go in order here chronologically. I guess the first thing would be Grace Lavery who I honestly didn't really know that much about before this piece came out, but I have become familiar since with this person's work. And most recently, Grace got attention for calling for the burning of a book that Grace disagreed with. And this is really shocking in an article about censorship to have a professor who has gone on record saying that they think books that they disagree with should be burned and this person has some sort of platform to criticize people and, and in regards to censorship it, it's really appalling that this was the expert they were able to drag out yeah um in a little bit i do i actually want to pull up those tweets but okay. for now let's keep going in the article mm -hmm. um but that is super important right because Yes. When you talk about allowing all voices in a discussion, there's sort of one piece that you actually don't want, which is the voice that's saying no to debate and discussion and the voice that's saying yes right. to suppression and censorship. So, okay. That so then the, the, <laughs> the next thing that jumps out at me then is the idea that we're a tiny minority. Um, this I actually sent in the emails, research debunking. Uh, the view of gender critical people is completely mainstream to the point where we're the overwhelming majority. Over two thirds of people generally agree with gender critical stances, uh, yep, right there, that say things along the lines of, you know, men and boys should not be able to compete in sports with women and girls. And most voters recognize that male sex offenders should not be placed in women's prisons. So these are all the things that gender critical feminists are advocating for. And these views are supported by an overwhelming majority of Americans. And this was a very robust poll that was conducted with one of the largest sample sizes of polling that took place around this time at the height of the presidential campaign period when things were really quite polarized. So I think this really should tell you a lot. No one has been able to debunk these numbers since they came out, but instead they just choose to ignore them and continue saying that we're a minority when we know as a matter of fact that the majority of Americans do recognize that biological sex matters, at least in some cases. Mm. Yep. Okay. I also wanted to just say something about this link right here when it says anti-trans feminists have a, I object to that label anti-trans feminists if I'm being included in that, uh, <laughs> have a presence in many mainstream online spaces, including Twitter. This link is to an undergraduate thesis, which I think is a very bizarre thing to cite in your Atlantic article. So it's an undergraduate thesis about tracking TERFs on Twitter. 
And it's especially interesting because we know, as a matter of fact, that radical feminists are getting banned left and right from Twitter, including many high profile instances of this, like Megan Murphy, who has been banned for uh, simply like misgendering someone. And so the idea that feminists have any sort of uh, foothold on Twitter is ridiculous. Mm. That's why we had to create our own spaces. <laughs> Right. There, there is a bit of a contradiction within the article there, isn't there? Right. 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 If we're so powerful on social media, why do we have to go elsewhere? Yeah. And yeah. then what about this? I've seen you tweeting about this, the Black Women's Beauty Forum, Lipstick Alley. Yeah, just another complete misrepresentation of another woman's space. Um, Lipstick Alley, despite the name, is a very uh, comprehensive forum for Black women, as it does say, but it covers all sorts of topics. It's really a go-to place that Black women can find advice or discussion on anything from politics to personal life to, you know, even this article was discussed on there. Um, it's simply not just a beauty forum. And I think that it really shows that the authors and editors of this piece just do not care about women's spaces and especially couldn't even be bothered to accurately describe one of, I would say, the largest spaces for Black women online. I don't know of one that's larger. I apologize if there is. Um, and the the calling it a beauty form really seems like an intentional way to belittle what goes on there and how powerful of a space that is for women. Um, obviously, I don't participate there much, but I mean, at all, I've never participated there. I just look occasionally. And I can tell you that it, to call it a beauty form, I would almost consider that an insult because I think it's really trying to belittle the, yeah, the power of the space. Mm. Okay. And then of course there's, you know, well-known radicalization website, Mumsnet. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, the scary British mums. <laughs> so Terrifying. <laughs> on these sites and others, they use many of the same trolling tactics as other internet-based fringe political movements to disrupt conversation, skew reality, <laughs> and make the internet another dangerous place for trans women through doxing and harassment. Now, this is one of the most, this is probably the most aggressive claim she made about in terms of what uh, so-called TERFs have done, the doxing and harassment. Um, yes. I didn't find sufficient evidence that this doxing occurred that she linked to. Do you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure which one she linked in that specific point, but when I had asked her, what are you talking about? The example that she sent me, there was no evidence of it ever occurring. And um, specifically, she's talking here about, like this whole article is about the spaces that we've built for ourselves. And she has not a single example of this occurring on a site like Oprah or Spinster that we have built for ourselves. And she could not find any evidence of gender critical women actually doing any of the things that she's talking about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, it, it was really a stretch of a claim to say based on, you know, one story that was told and never verified to claim that this is something that happens with any sort of regularity is ridiculous. Right. So this article that she linked to here for doxing and harassment, it talked about a doxing of someone named Victoria and then it linked to a tweet that, oh, I guess I'm blocked from seeing it, but then these tweets are deleted. So, okay, I don't know about that. Um, Anti-trans activists have used social media to call out specific trans women who use women's bathrooms, for instance, labeling them predators and pedophiles and promising to resist them by any means necessary, be it pepper spray or pistol. I think we have to stop there because that's a little bit and talk about that. <laughs> Yeah. So I, <laughs> have you followed these links? Because I read these links as well. No, I have not followed any of the links that were included in this article. So this, uh, the pistol one is a Republican woman said that she'll bring a gun into Target's bathroom because they had a bathroom policy about gender neutral, I guess. But I don't think she is a feminist. So I don't really think she is... I'm not condoning what she said. I, I don't know. It's a pro-gun position, I guess, but um, nothing against guns per se, but uh, 
I don't know. That one doesn't actually back up the um, the claim. Yeah, the that idea that this terms. is taking place in gender critical or turf communities, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> and then the pepper spray was a Reddit thread. Okay. <laughs> so it was a Reddit thread. I don't know. People, people can follow and read these it, through and through on their own, but yeah. I don't think that, you know, I did read it and I think it's a slight mischaracterization to say promising to resist trans women. That's what she's saying in this sentence. Right. That the anti-trans activists are promising to resist them by any means necessary. I, you have to come to your own conclusion, but I don't think that was completely true. Yeah. Uh, and, and without seeing much besides what you just showed me, I would guess that most of these are not specifically saying I'm going to bring a weapon to use it against a trans person in a bathroom, I would imagine it's women saying, I don't feel safe in a bathroom where there are males. And so I feel like I need to arm myself now. Yeah. And mm -hmm. for protection. And I mean, we do have a second amendment in this country, whether you agree with it or not, like that is a civil right that Americans hold is the right to bear arms and protect themselves. And if women are feeling so scared that they feel that they need to arm themselves, I don't think that the problem is with the people who feel physically threatened. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, but I haven't I mean, read the specific post. That's just my instinct based on what I'm seeing here. Right. And, you know, I mean, I don't think I'm going to, I'm not going to stand behind like every woman on that thread or this woman who right. said she's going to have her pistol. But what I'm saying is just that there is an overblown, the way this is written is, um, is exaggerating for its narrative purpose. Yeah, and none of it actually happened on the forums that she's go, that she goes on to talk about. So she sets up sort of these things, like, look, these things happened on the internet, and then talks about specific groups like are gender critical and over it, but none of those things happen in these specific communities. And so she really sets it up as if we're the ones doing these things when it has nothing to do with us. Yeah. Yes, and just to be one last point about that, um, those things were all just words. They weren't threats of violence. They weren't incitements to violence. They were just words. So again, words are violence to some, some people. Yeah. Um, Vlad has shown that these sort of attacks have warped online discourse, turning focus away from discrimination and instead encouraging renewed debate about trans women's bodies. Now, in parentheses, you have Fane insists that her views are utterly mainstream and common sense. She denied that members of her community engage in doxing, harassment, or threats. Yes, that's correct. Okay. <laughs> and, and I can say for certainty that we, I'm not a moderator of over it, but I know that they have rules against all of those things. And so if it did happen there, it would result in a ban for that user mm -hmm. and same with on communities that i do moderate like spinster we have rules against every single one of those things and if it happened it would be deleted and the user would receive some sort of punishment likely a ban have you seen that happen on spinster doxing so Yes, but not by the gender critical community, aimed at the gender critical community. We've had trans activists who come on to post threats towards us saying that they're threatening to dox us, I know where you live, et cetera, coming on specifically to uh, target specific women who they followed from another platform and then continue their harassment of them on Spinster. And we've had threats of doxing on Spinster against our users as well, um, but I, have to say we've never had that from the gender critical community towards the trans community at any sort of scale. I mean, sometimes users harass each other, you know, like when they get in a fight or something, but no, mm -hmm. no, we just simply don't have that occurring in that direction. Okay. For years, our gender critical, the group Fain joined, was the internet's largest and most recognizable anti-trans space, known on Reddit as a major pipeline into turf ideology. I really like that one, the major pipeline. <laughs> um, this abruptly changed in June, however, when our gender critical disappeared from Reddit. 
the cataclysmic events of 2020 had pushed all major social media platforms into content moderation crisis mode, compelling them to adopt a new dedication to remove to removing misinformation and hate speech, adding friction to prevent harassment and viral conspiracy theories. Reddit responded to pressure from its users in the midst of the Black Lives Matter protests by introducing an overhauled content policy that contained specific rules about hate speech. Its implementation resulted in an automatic ban for our gender critical. No warning, the notorious pro-Trump forum R the Donald was removed the same day along with about 2000 other forums. So uh, that's a mostly accurate description of those events um, with her obvious angle. But one thing that I think is important to note is this idea that it was an automatic ban. I don't know where that's coming from. I've never seen any indication that this was conducted without any oversight by some sort of human at Reddit. I believe that the subreddits uh, there, there's no indication that this was done automatically through any sort of AI or, or anything like that that recognized the sub without a human having a say in it. I believe that each sub was chosen that was banned. Um, so I don't know where that came from. That's a pretty big difference. Yeah, yeah, you know? because the implication of an automatic ban is that they were able to identify things that would target us for removal. But in fact, what happened is it was just removed with no warning. And then the administrators refused to provide the former mods any sort of evidence as to why they were banned. They just claimed it was for hate speech and they could provide not a single piece of evidence. Interesting. Do you know anything yeah. about this overhauled content policy about the specific rules regarding hate speech? Uh, yes, that did happen. I don't know a ton about it, but I, I remember it at the time. Okay, I didn't read this link, and I'm curious about how they define hate speech, but it's a whole other issue. Yeah. <laughs> I well, mean, they defined it very yeah, loosely. I would imagine, yeah. Yeah. So, is this the only mention of the Donald, by the way? Because I was wondering, how did she slip that into the headline when the article is not even remotely about the Donald? Yeah, you know, I, I don't quite remember, actually. I can do a search. Yeah. No, okay, there's- Oh, it's a few other times. Hits. Yeah. Um, anyway. Okay, Fain framed the ban flatly as persecution. They use the label hate speech to silence speech they don't want, she told me. Radical feminism does not come from a place of hate nor anything even remotely near it. Radical feminism comes from a place of love for women and girls. I don't know, that sounds pretty hateful to me. That's a, a mostly accurate quote, except that she put the period where there was a comma and did not continue the rest of the sentence, oh. which is um, included in the emails. Okay, let's find that email. Yeah. Maybe if you search for like love, you'll find it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh-huh, right here. Right. So I actually said radical feminism comes from a place of love for women and girls, an understanding of the patriarchy, and a desire to see the end of the global terrorism of male violence. Hmm. So okay. why yeah. she chose to cut those phrases out is, you know, yeah. maybe it was just for a word count, but I knows? like seeing the, the places where she just used part of a quote, so keep directing us to those. Yes. I think that's pretty interesting. Okay. I mean, yeah, like you said, obviously we're not expecting a journalist to just use every single quote you said. So right, of course. Don't misunderstand us. Okay. <laughs> Almost immediately, she joined a core group of our gender critical members in an effort to rebuild what they lost. In about a month, they came up with Over It, a new invite only Reddit inspired platform. They transferred over archived threads that were preserved before the ban and started inviting women one by one to a more secluded space. Freed from the constraints of a major platform and unwanted attention from a broader internet public, the site was built not just as a safe space to protect themselves and carry on as before, when our gender critical moderator wrote after the migration, but to become even bigger. Anything wrong with that? Uh, no, that's pretty accurate, I would say. Okay. TERFs are far from the only banned communities that have taken matters into their own hands in this way. For years, the conversation about online moderation has been about pressing major social media companies to take responsibility for what happens on their platforms. But now that these companies are finally doing so, and by the way, I just want to say when she's saying take responsibility for what happens on their platforms, 
she's talking about censorship. She's talking about tech censorship, right? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay. But now that these companies are finally doing so, reactionary online pl alternative platforms such as Over It are popping up like mushrooms. Many of the exiled groups behind them have little in the way of shared ideology or politics, but they do share a fixation on the way they've been persecuted. And they raise a whole new set of questions about how to break down the internet structural pension for hate. Well, besides the implication that we're a hate group, I overall actually mostly agree with that paragraph. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is the rhetoric that is used about groups like white supremacists or Nazis or something because she's talking about the difficulty of dealing with those online groups. Uh, so yes. she's sort of putting us in that camp when she is describing uh, Turks in this way. Yes, it's really a guilt by association, except our only association is that we've both been banned by Reddit. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, the phrase online echo chambers generally refers to self-created silos on websites that are enormous. I can't be the only one who read that sentence and then immediately scrolled back up to where she said it was radical that you believe she became, eventually her beliefs radicalized further. She became convinced that trans women are men. And then down here, she just said that that is an online echo chamber. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I'm spotting an online echo chamber, all right. But it's yeah. not the one she is spotting. Okay, on Facebook, you can find yourself in a right-wing or left-wing bubble, but the other side is there engaging with the same algorithmically accelerated trends, occasionally getting fired up enough to jump into a fruitless debate. Now though, there are early signs that the bubbles are moving even further apart. Pundits and politicians on the right have been threatening to migrate en masse away from the big tech platforms they view as sensorial. Not sensorial enough for Kayla and Tiffany. And set up shop on a free speech site such as Parler or Gab, Activists on the left who have their own disdain for big tech have long been at the forefront of the push for decentralized social networks such as Mastodon. Meanwhile, getting banned from a social media platform and creating a knockoff of it is effectively a rite of passage for toxic groups at this point. That's actually a pretty decent overview of the current state of affairs. Okay. I mean, I disagree that we're toxic, but yeah. the, <laughs> the gist of it minus her judgment, if you can read around that part is correct, I would say. And by the way, I just wanted to say, you know, you, you told me before we started recording that you, you only read it the one time and now this is your second read after that initial yeah. one. So we're getting kind of like that react. I mean, you already reacted to it, but. Yeah, I mean, the first time I read it was mostly just a, oh my God, this is out. Like, and since then I've actually been, I didn't want to torture myself by reading yeah, it over and over. So uh, you're getting to torture me live on camera. Oh, God. <laughs> See, that's the oh I'm kidding. Of, that's the type of literal violence that we <laughs> yes, Exactly. Okay. Can I ask you, though, what, so she keeps saying toxic, you know, just to be fair, I mean, what, what's in it? Is there toxicity? Like, what's something, what's the most toxic yeah. thing you've seen? No, honestly, there totally is toxicity. But I think the difference is that, like, there is no difference between how toxic a gender critical form is versus any other form on the web. I mean, right now, well, maybe not right now, a couple months ago, there was this drama going on in the knitting community related to some sort of social justice issue. And people were getting called out and targeted and harassed left and right in the Instagram knitting community. On YouTube, I'm, I'm a big plant person. I love houseplants. And so I follow a lot of YouTubers who talk about houseplants. And there has been a lot of drama and toxicity in the YouTube houseplant community. And so I think that that is a part of the internet. I don't think it has anything to do with gender critical groups in particular. I, like people are toxic and where they go, toxicity follows. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. All kinds of these groups have created their own independent havens. When Reddit started moderating R. The Donald, which had nearly 800,000 members at the time it was banned, the, cre the community created the Donald Win as a home for its racist memes and indecipherable blend of irony and hatred. 
again, that she's putting TERFs and Trump supporters side by side, right? Yes. Yeah, it's very intentional to, to create this association that doesn't otherwise exist so that we can be guilty by it. Yeah. And as we know, all Trump supporters are evil, so. Of course. That's a joke. In case <laughs> Goes anyone, without saying. In case that was an undecipherable <laughs> blend of irony. <laughs> okay. The notoriously violent incel community. Yeah, I didn't follow that link, so I'm sort of, I'm curious about that link, but whatever, it's not relevant to us. Was also banned and moved onto a hate side of its own. The men's rights activists in R the Red Pill weren't banned, only quarantined, which means the group doesn't show up in Reddit search, but they made a new site as well. Fane, who's now an icon in the online turf community, congratulations, <laughs> has you. made a whole constellation of radical feminist platforms. She created the blogging platform 4W after she was banned from Medium. She created Spinster XYZ, which she said has about 14,000 users as an alternative to Twitter in response to the many radical feminists who are being silenced or banned. So an update correction to that is that thanks to the Atlantic, we're now at over 16,000. <gasps> oh, that's exciting. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. But otherwise, yeah, that's a mostly accurate uh, paragraph there. Okay. Although I do disagree that I'm an icon in online term <laughs> communities. That's so funny. Where, where did she source that from? Who said that? I want to know who said that. Yeah, Can you please cite your source? That. Right. Let me send them a thank you bouquet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. To build over it, Fane organized with the former moderators of Our Gender Critical and a handful of other collaborators in a Discord server. Making a new website from scratch would take too long, so they looked for a pre-existing platform with open source, uh, open source code. The team thought about using the open source software behind Sadit, a popular Reddit alternative that hosts many banned Reddit communities, including the QAnon subreddit subreddit r pedogate and the snuff film subreddit r watch people die but it wasn't secure enough we have another asterisk uh-oh i love that, that one's not as reading. complicated or corrections yeah okay so tell us what was the correction that happened here yeah so this one isn't really particularly insidious i don't think um i think she just misunderstood the technology and what we were considering so first she said that we were considering moving to set it um, which is its own website, but then set it software is uh, open source. And so what we were actually considering was forking their software and creating our own website, which would be completely independent from set it. Uh, we never had any intention of using an existing platform and like actually setting up shop on there that was just controlled by more men. So that, um, but I think she just misunderstood that because I, don't really think she understands open source software from from what I gathered through our conversations and the article. So just to be clear, because I'm not, you know, a technological expert either, but mm -hmm. what's the so so then what connection did you actually have to set it? If any. None. We we had thought about uh, using their software to build over it, and instead we used a different software to build over it. Okay, so the relevance of her mentioning Pedogay and the snuff film thing is is none. Ten years past <laughs> is not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay, so that wasn't secure enough. The group was worried about cyber attacks. Another platform, Rattle, didn't offer moderation tools, which would be important if outsiders ever came to over it to cause trouble. They thought about Lemmy, a federated alternative to Reddit, which hosts the also banned Reddit community, community dedicated to the popular left-wing podcast Tra Chapo Trap House. Fane said that didn't work out because the developers of Lemmy are actively anti-feminist, while the developers told me their code of conduct contains a section against anti-trans bigotry, which means we wouldn't help them in any way. So that's like a half truth. Um, that was one of the reasons that we didn't choose Lemmy. But the main reason was actually the exact same that she mentioned with Rattle, which is that they don't offer moderation tools, uh, at least at the time. I don't know if they've updated their software since. But at the time, what the deal was with both Rattle and Lemmy was that there was no report function. <laughs> you could not report a post and moderators could not take action on the post, which is a major thing. And, you know, the people act 
you know, this article even says we're a lawless land, but we actually really wanted robust moderation tools, and that was just not available in either of those at the time. We really actually liked Lemmy as a software because it has the potential to be federated in the future, and as free software activists who, you know, care about decentralization, that was something that we did like, and honestly, moving away from Lemmy because of the moderation, or lack of moderation, was actually a pretty hard decision, and the I. And, but the fact that they were anti-feminist and could make our lives hard was like one part of that decision-making pie. And it definitely was not the main part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else about that paragraph? No. <laughs> okay. Finally, Fane and the others settled on an open source platform called Throat run by the Argentinian developer Ramiro Bao. Throat was created in 2016 as an alternative to Vote, another Reddit alternative, which was hosting many of the most disgusting former subreddits and had already become unusably toxic, as might be expected of any site, branded as a home for a conversation too disgusting for 2015 Reddit. When I asked Boo, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, about over its use of his code, he told me, they're nice people, and that they're currently one of the most active communities on Throat. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I agree. They're nice people too, the developers of Threat, and I appreciate that he said that. <laughs> that one made me laugh because I thought that um, the way she put it in is almost like saying, oh, this guy says they're nice people. Oh, God. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Like it's some sort of insult to be called nice by this guy. Yeah. Um, no, I think we have a really good relationship with the upstream maintainers. And I think something that actually we're quite proud of on the over development team is how much open source code we have contributed to a project beyond just over it. Like this is software that anyone can fork and use and they all benefit from the contributions that we've made to the open source community in our creation of over it. And so right now, anyone today could create a site exactly like over it with you know pretty limited technical knowledge just getting it set up on a server is the main thing and uh, I'm really proud of all the contributions we've made to that team and I really enjoyed working with them all right so our gender critical setup shop on a new instance of an alternative to an alternative to reddit over it looks exactly like reddit except it's purple <gasps> <laughs> And subreddits are called circles. There is a circle called canceled, which is specifically for talking about attempts to silence those who speak out against the queer cults. There is a circle called trans logic, which is specifically for talking about misogynistic and illogical things trans activists say and do. There are general interest circles for talking about books, television, science, and knitting. There is a circle called rad femory, which is for memes and jokes about how much the people in it do not like trans women. Hmm, that sounds mean. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> It, that's not entirely it, but it's mostly jokes about gender ideology. I don't know. She obviously took ones that she thought would sound interesting in the context of her article. Yeah. I, yeah. I, she didn't cite anything about jokes about how they do not like trans women, so it's another assertion that she hasn't backed up. No, the whole thing lacks any evidence. Yeah. The tone of the discussion in most of the circles is insular and defensive. Much of it is about the way big tech is censoring radical feminist thought by driving women, a deliberately exclusionary term that prizes women with female reproductive organs off of their platforms, as well as the way the mainstream media has been taken over by a tiny minority of men, which is how over its members refer to trans women. The plight of JK Rowling is revisited off. <laughs> Okay, what I mean, about that? Gosh, I don't know. The the Woomben thing is so funny because we were joking in our, our group chat earlier that there's like one or two users on the site who say that. And if women who like that term come to over it thinking, oh, this is a place where I, I'll be full of people who use this term, they're going to be sorely disappointed okay. <laughs> because mostly we think it's silly. Um, gotcha. No shade to anyone who does, I guess, but it, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's just obviously she's trying to frame it a certain way to act like it's all about being mean to trans women and completely ignoring all the really positive and uplifting and empowering community that's built there, um, the support that women are getting for everything that they're going through. I mean, the way that she puts 
the uh, description of being canceled in quotes as if it's not something that happens when you and I can actually provide some evidence, you know, crazy idea that it does happen. <laughs> and I think the whole framing here is obviously like really taking very specific pieces and trying to put them together in a way that makes us sound so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, but anyone I think can just look it over it and make up their own mind. Right. Right. What an idea. But I also just wanted to say, you know, this line about a deliberately exclusionary term that prizes women with female reproductive organs <laughs> and in context of saying that they make jokes about how much they do not like trans women. TERFs don't, I don't want to use that about, I, I, that's been like the thing that people just say, fuck it, let's call ourselves TERFs, but I kind of don't want to do that because it's not, yeah. it's not accurate and it's not, it's, it's not an okay term to use. So anyway, people who get accused of this stuff who are feminists, um, it's not, there, there's nothing about not liking trans women. Yeah, I'm sure there are transphobic people in this group right. of people because there probably are in any group of people, but it's not about not liking trans women. This exclusionary term is not about prizing women with female reproductive organs. It's about defining women in an, yes, it is an exclusionary definition because all definitions are, otherwise they just wouldn't mean anything. So when we say a woman, if you have female reproductive organs, you are a woman, mm -hmm. that's not mean. That's just a fact. Yeah, oh, I'm so glad you called that out because it's so true. I mean, and a lot of times, you, if you actually spent time really engaging with some of the content on Over, I think you would see we actually mostly have a lot of sympathy for like just humans in general. We're, we tend to be a really empathetic group of women, and that's often how we ended up here is through empathizing with other women and girls through experiencing what it's like to be gender non-conforming in society in one way or another and feeling that pressure of you know being told like well girls aren't like that so maybe you're not a girl um like these are all things that i think are really deeply emotional and empathetic topics and instead she has managed to frame it like we're a bunch of mean harpies just cackling over some like horribly cruel memes yeah. um and it, it's just not like even if that is a part of it even if we do cackle over our cruel memes <laughs> um it's just such a small part of what being a radical feminist or being gender critical actually means um and like i said to her in my responses is that I think that humor is a pretty effective coping mechanism. I think that, and she asked me, you know, what do I feel about some of these? And I told her that I, I mean, this was mentioned at the very end of the article, but uh, with a little bit of a spoiler, I, I told her that I think that, you know, why aren't women allowed to make jokes about something that affects them so personally and deeply? Like, how else are we supposed to survive? We're actually not out there doing all this violence that you accuse us of. We, like, actually channel this into emotionally healthy outlets, like finding support in a community and making jokes. Those are actually pretty emotionally healthy outlets for dealing with something very, very personal and complicated that often comes with a lot of baggage and trauma for each of us individually. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Let's keep going. We've still got a lot to cover. I know. In a practice carried over from Reddit, members are encouraged to share their conversion stories. That was a very deliberate word, wasn't it? Conversion story, which yes. they confusingly call their peak trans moment. If it was confusing, then maybe learn why they say that and then write it in your article. Yeah, I mean, it's not confusing, I think, for anyone who speaks English, but I don't know. Maybe. Okay. Well, let's not be uh, non-English speaker phobic. On this. <laughs> okay. In a typical exchange, one woman explains that she came to over it after dragging herself out of a trans rights oriented Tumblr community and falling down a YouTube rabbit hole. Another replies that her story is extremely similar, right down to her discomfort with her previous social circles explanation that she be supportive of men in lipstick. Many of these stories are told with a sense of excitement, guilt, fear, it's disturbing, but thrilling, Lavery, the UC Berkeley professor, told me. All the usual stuff that people who get involved in extremist groups find. 
the users joke and bicker like all political groups and then they come back together bonded by their shared experience of being unwelcome most anywhere else before you make your comment i just want to say again the word extremist and the word radicalization that's being used here it puts me in mind of terrorism and violent related activities so okay <laughs> now what do you yeah. have to say about that no, I agree with that. Besides her strategic use of judgmental adjectives that have not been supported by the evidence up to this point in the article, I think it's like a fairly decent representation of how like your opinion can be changed online through reading stuff and then the idea that yeah, we bicker and then come back together. Uh, yeah, I mean that part is true. And I do think that this is a little bit like I don't know. I do think it's representative of how people learn to question a mainstream narrative. But I will say that there's definitely many women, especially older women, who have been feminists for their whole life and never thought a man could become a woman. And these people haven't been radicalized by YouTube or anything. These are really the leaders of the radical feminist movement. And, the, you know, these are the books on my shelf, the people whose work I really admire. And they didn't need YouTube or gender critical to radicalize them because they just knew it. <laughs> I mean, but would you even say that if you learned it from YouTube or the internet that you were radicalized? Well, we do call ourselves radical feminists, so it's hard for me to say that, well, we're not radical. Um, but I think that the specific idea that's in question here, can a man become a woman? I do not think that saying no to that is a radical opinion in any way, because we, as discussed earlier, know that it is shared by the overwhelming majority of Americans and of humans on Earth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, just to further drive the point home, is like, I'm not a radical feminist. I, I like a lot of the tenets of radical feminism because to me it's the most uh, sensible form of feminism that I've come across. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's just we're all being painted with the same brush. So uh, yeah, because I'm I've been called a turf, obviously, but I'm not a radical feminist. So there yeah. you have it. Uh, and some of the most prominent turfs are the same. Like Megan Murphy, for example, specifically says she's not a radical feminist. Yeah. Okay, maybe now is a good time to just bring up Lavery's tweets. Should we try to break? Let's them? do it. <laughs> okay. So do you remember when this happened? Because I remember and I was just like horrified. This UC Berkeley professor is I, encouraging book burning. No, I think that around the time that it was happening, I was like really busy with some work stuff and wasn't a ton on Twitter. So I missed the initial blow up over it. Um, but then later did uh, I wrote an article for 4W about Abigail Schreier and did learn about this at the time when I was researching for that article. Um, but I, I, the name didn't stick in my head. So when I first read the name in this Atlantic article, I didn't put the pieces together until someone mentioned it on, um, on Twitter. Yeah, okay. I knew immediately who it was. It's was <laughs> like, oh, here we go. So, since some people have misunderstood my tone and censorship is an important matter, and as a public educator, a UC Berkeley professor of literature, I have a duty to be precise. Let me clarify, I do not advocate defacing library books. I do encourage followers to steal Abigail Shire's book and burn it on fire. So thanks for clearing that up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then there was another tweet thread about the book that was where Grace Lavery mocked the, by the way, that was just a joke. So that's what Grace says. That was just a joke. So we don't Right. Need to Their jokes thing. are just jokes. <laughs> Our jokes are literal violence. Uh-huh. Good point. I, I'd like to show the tweet about the melon scooper. Have you seen that tweet? No. Well... When Grace Lavery, I might have to put it back on the screen after because yeah. so I'll just stop sharing for a sec. I'm going to put this up on the screen. She tweeted that something like she, she, Grace was mocking Abigail Schreier's book, which is about teenage transitioners, female to male. And right. um, the joke was like, oh, this this cover is so sensationalist and it's showing like it's a, it's like, oh, no, mommy, they scooped out my insides with a melon scooper. What? How insensitive can you be? Yeah. Wow. And I mean, they say that we are cruel and mocking of people's struggles. Like, 
that is like we're talking about actual human girls children who have had their body parts like removed and we should probably find that since we're talking about it so we keep going wow. while i find it i mean it yeah, that's just crazy that you can say something like that and then be considered the compassionate one, the empathetic one, the one who has people's best interest in heart. Um, I I think that's really shocking. I think even women who are trans uh, allies or activists would find that pretty offensive, a description of what a young trans identified female might go through with her body. Mm hmm. Yeah, it was really hateful. Yeah. Well, hopefully I didn't completely misrepresent it in my summary <laughs> because I can't find it right now, but I'll put it up on the screen. Okay. Okay, so where were we with this beautiful article? We just got a quote from the wonderful Professor Lavery. Okay. <sighs> so far, the only major challenge between over it and our gender critical, the only major difference between over it and our gender critical is that here nobody challenges the members. There are no outsider trolls butting into the conversation to tell them they're wrong. On Reddit, some women were uncomfortable being totally candid, Fane told me, but here they can be themselves. It was really hard to be on Reddit as a woman. She said, now on over it, it's a big breath of fresh air. Yeah, I mean, that's mostly accurate. I don't actually remember what the whole thing was that she dot dot dotted because I was from a phone call, um, oh, okay. but it it feels to me like that might that was an accurate representation of what I said. Um, okay. I think I probably just elaborated on why it was hard to be a woman on Reddit. Yeah, I mean, to I, I think she, the way she inserted your quote here was like saying that it was it's hard to be a woman uh, on Reddit because you can't be as hateful as you want to be. Because she's saying nobody challenges the members. She's yeah, she's yeah. Implying that's what you like about it. Um, whereas you can even tell from your quote that that's not what the case was. You said it, well, it, you said it was really hard to be a woman, uh, to be on Reddit as a woman. And she's almost framing it like that's because you were being challenged. Right. We were being questioned. Like, oh, you had to answer tough questions on Reddit. How, like, and you found that so hard. No, that's not at all what it was. Of, of course, it's hard being a woman on Reddit because there's constant stalking, doxing, and harassment on Reddit. And anything that you say on Reddit as a woman immediately gets thrown back in your face. Um, there's, you know, even memes about how there's no women on Reddit because you cannot, like people just assume that you're a man. And then if you're proven to be a woman, then you're basically treated like dirt. Uh, it's just not a welcoming place for women, especially considering all of the pornography and subs that were there, and many of them still are dedicated specifically to hating women. The user base there is just incredibly hateful towards women. So it was hard um, to be a woman there. <laughs> By the way, I messaged Caitlin Tiffany on Twitter yesterday, and I invited her to come on my podcast too. So, you know, Ooh. I'm ready for the hard questions. So I, <laughs> I welcome a challenge. I, I would be really surprised if you hear back from her. <laughs> yeah. But of course, that's the ethical journalist thing to do is to offer a right of reply. Yeah, I asked, I told her that you were going to be speaking with me. I asked if she wanted to comment on the claim that she, you know, omitted most of your reply, or she often admitted, uh, you know, omitted your replies. So, mm -hmm. you know, give her a chance. Um, but she might not be on Twitter at all right now because of the shit storm that's going down. Yeah, I wouldn't blame her, honestly, from stepping away. Yeah. Uh, she's yeah. really been getting a lot of personal shit for the article. Oh, and okay. I guess one thing I do want to say is towards my followers, to people listening to me who respect what I have to say for whatever reason, I, I would not direct your anger towards the author specifically. I think she is a symptom of a much wider problem in mainstream media. Uh, she's a staff writer at The Atlantic, and she has editors and bosses and a job on the line that, you know, she's just as afraid of getting fired as the rest of us. And who knows, like, I have actually no idea how sympathetic she actually was to our ideas and how much of this was changed by her editors. And I know that a lot of stuff that she originally asked me about did not end up in the ultimate article. So how much of this article was shaped by the editorial process at The Atlantic and how much of it was her, we really have no way of knowing. So I would save your ire if you would like to direct it towards The Atlantic specifically and, or towards, you know, just 
the mainstream media platforms as a whole rather than towards the specific author because um, I think she is just one cog in a machine and we're, we can't, yeah, I, I would just disagree with targeting her specifically. Okay, yeah, thank you for saying that. And yeah. um, what's so shocking is that this is in the Atlantic. It's not some little newspaper, it's the Atlantic. Right, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. In its early years, Reddit was known as a platform for free speech absolutism, as was Twitter, which called itself the free speech wing of the free speech party. But as the site got larger, it was pushed by its own users to realize what that really means. Completely unimpeded speech for some, those who want to express hate inherently limits speech for others. Okay, she's trying to explore some of those ideas, which are very interesting topics of discussion. Mm -hmm. Most hate speech is protected by the First Amendment, but that obligation doesn't apply to social media companies. Getting banned from Reddit is not a legal consequence of speaking, it's a social one. I agree with that. I don't think we've ever made claims to the contrary. Mm -hmm. The goal of online moderation can be thought of in two ways. The point can be to reduce hate speech or extremism on Reddit, Facebook, or any other specific platform, which has gotten much easier to argue for in terms of business interest and consumer preference, or it can be to limit the spread of these things across the internet more broadly, which is a much more abstract project. As radical communities multiply on the outskirts of the internet, whose responsibility is it to worry about them? Yeah, so, so that bit right there is a little concerning to me because the implication seems to be that something needs to be done about these you know, sites that are popping up that they can't control. So the, I, the idea here is really, well, they aren't on this mainstream one anymore. So now like someone needs to find a solution to them. Like how do we get rid of them now when they're on their own, when they're independent? And I think that's, that's pretty threatening, honestly, to say that if you create an independent platform, then we're going to like find a way to take care of you essentially. Like at that, I mean, I have some guesses at what could be meant by that. I'm not going to say them because I don't want to give people ideas. Um, but there are other ways that you can continue to target an independently run website. And it's pretty concerning that it seems like she's, I mean, she's just raising the question here. And I'm not opposed to raising the question. But in the broader context of the article, the implication seems to be someone needs to take care of them. Yeah. There is a case to be made that these communities should not be kicked off major sites in the first place. If you remove a group like our gender critical from Reddit, that group will move on to a more lawless part of the web. Okay, she kind of has it both ways, I'm not gonna lie. For her, Reddit is the cesspool of hate, or at least 2015 Reddit was, but then at the same time, it's a more lawful part of the web. Yeah, no, it's ridiculous because we have way more rules on over it than ever existed on Reddit. I mean, the, the content moderation on over it is incredibly strict and uh, I actually could not be a moderator there, even if I wanted to be, because I have a much more liberal idea of uh, protecting speech than over it as a community does. And the idea that it's a lawless part of the web is ridiculous. I mean, it's also not the dark web. Like, we're still obliged by all of the same laws as every other website in the nation at, like you know assuming where it's hosted and it's a ridiculous right, assumption right this, this shows she doesn't understand anything about the internet honestly okay okay and she is the tech reporter right yeah um, yeah <laughs> the escalation of rhetoric there isn't slowed by any platform rules Wait, where are we talking about? The more lawless part of the web? The escalation yeah, of rhetoric the, there. The place where we have a ton of rules. <laughs> yeah. And it also isn't hemmed in by any dissenting voices, says Luke Cosino, an internet researcher at the University of Waterloo. There is not even the slightest pressure to dial back hateful speech in order to seem well-intentioned and approachable. Keeping everyone near one another might come with a sort of social content moderation, Cosino suggests. He hasn't researched whether this works, but it's an important point. You can't de-radicalize anyone if they're off in their own world. I mean, if we were so off in our own world, then how could we radicalize anyone if it can't work the other way around? I, yeah. The idea that we can't be de-radicalized because we're alone, but we're a threat to the rest of the world because we're radicalizing everyone else when we're off on our own. It, I, again, it's trying to have it both ways. Okay, can I ask you a question? What's the most radical view you hold? Uh, that animals should be legally considered persons. 
Hmm. non-human animals well you know that would get you on a few terrorist watch lists so oh yes <laughs> yes i mean no the, the most radical views i hold i think are definitely animal rights ones uh, i've participated in a lot of animal rights activism that is illegal and with organizations that have been considered um domestic terrorist organizations wow. and i'm not currently affiliated with but i've done that activism um so my my most radical feminist perspective um Hmm. It's hard Mine because it's probably that men aren't women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> probably, I mean, I'm trying to think what is an actually radical position, but you're right. Like in today's society, that is the most radical position that you can hold as a feminist. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Thank you. Okay. Um, Lavery is sympathetic to this reasoning, but she emphasizes that keeping turfs. Oh, but by the way, I do think it's a good point that. Um, you don't always want to just exclude people who really are radicalized in a violent way. So yeah, we'll give, yeah. We'll give Tiffany some credit. I agree. And that's actually why I support decentralized platforms and why actually over it is really interested in uh, integrating with a decentralized system. And that was something that from the very beginning we were trying to figure out how to do. The technology doesn't currently exist for a forum style um software but you know for example spinster my other project is decentralized for this exact reason is to create uh basically to uncreate an echo chamber you know to make sure that we're not doing everything that this article accuses us of okay okay that's important information Lavery is sympathetic to this reasoning, but she emphasizes that keeping TERFs in close proximity to trans women comes with a severe price. Continued harassment, bad faith attacks, and implied or explicit threats of violence. I just think it's- We're just not the ones doing that. That's all I was going to say. That's all I was going to yeah. say. No, it's um, a lie. Well, I was just going to say that sentence could be actually read. That sentence doesn't specify who's doing it. That's true. So. I mean, you could rewrite that sentence to say, Keeping women in close, in close proximity to men on the internet results in harassment, attacks, and threats and violence. And I actually do agree with that. <laughs> yeah. But here it's implied that the TERFs are the ones doing that. So Always. Lavery has spent years observing the way anti-trans activists target and terrorize trans women, including herself. This is the part that I looked into this and I did not find evidence of her being doxxed. If anyone has it, I would like them to send it to me. Okay, trans people deserve to be online, she told me. This is often unbelievably difficult. The journalist Caitlin Burns wrote last year about how the internet is weaponized against trans people. She had personally been doxxed, been harassed on Twitter, and watched members of Our Gender Critical dig up and mock pictures of taken of her and her children before her transition. That, I looked into this Caitlin Burns I personally could not find proof that she was doxxed, just in a search. Yeah, same. Okay. Um, this is the one that Caitlin, the author, had sent to me and said, do you have a response to this? And I told her that uh, I had asked the gender critical mods about this instance and they told me, and so now we're getting kind of a few degrees of separation here, um, but they told me that at the time of the incident, if you search Vox, that might probably be uh, this specific incident. Mm -hmm. so Sorry, that's her, her question. Is this the question? Yeah. Okay. I know you already said that the gender critical community doesn't engage in doxing harassment, but since it came up in an interview I did for the story and in a Vox piece written last year, that piece was by... By Caitlin Burns. By Caitlin Burns. Yep. I wanted to give you another chance to respond to that. Are you sure you would say that it never happens? Yeah. And then so your then... response was this, right? Yeah. There was an initial response I said, which was basically, I never heard of it, but I'm sorry if it happened. Okay. Um, and then this was my follow-up response to that. Okay, so you said, P.S., I just asked the mods. So you followed up. First, you said you, you hadn't heard of it. And yes. then you followed up and checked and said, I just asked the mods about the instant, this, this instance. Girl Undone said that when the article was released, they tried to verify the claim and found no record. Okay. Yep. And yeah, because after I heard of this, I was pretty surprised, honestly, that this is something that would have happened. And it didn't sound to me like something I believed had happened. And so I 
followed up immediately with the mods and said, did this happen? And they have no record of it. Even before their records from RGC being banned were mm -hmm. wiped, they did not have a record of that post ever existing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So this article now by Caitlin Burns, the one that's being cited about the doxing, um, you know, it's, she asserts that she was doxed, but she doesn't show any, and I did a quick Google search, Caitlin Burns doxing. I didn't find anything. Again, I'm not a, I'm not an investigator, but that's just what I didn't find. Yeah. And, and what's also interesting, and I said this in my initial reply to other Caitlin as well, is that the article itself, the Vox article, clarifies that the doxing did not occur on our gender critical. What she's saying happened on our gender critical was that uh, we dug up and mocked pictures taken with her children or something. Um, that part, again, that's the post that was supposedly on our gender critical is these photos. And that was the post that the uh, mods had no record of. So the it, even to say that you know, this person was doxxed in the context of this article is again implying that radical feminists or gender critical feminists had anything to do with that. When in reality, this person is a writer who writes about a lot of stuff. And, you know, as the author, Caitlin Tiffany probably knows is that writers are off, journalists are often targeted for doxing um, by people who disagree with what they're writing. And it has nothing to do with this, uh, with the gender critical community, this is a public figure who is writing a lot of stuff that I'm not surprised made them a target, although I obviously disapprove of that. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I do too. I hate doxing, so that's why I wanna know of course. if this is occurring um, yeah. in this direction. Okay, so the banning approach, the research about what happens when toxic groups are removed from Reddit is limited, but encouraging. Hate speech across the site went down after a purge of such communities in 2015, which made the site more usable for a more diverse group of people. A recent study of the new off Reddit platforms for R the Donald and R incels found that the number of people who use those sites is substantially smaller than the number of people who participated in their respective subreddits and growth is much slower. Without Reddit, these extremists struggle to recruit. And you know, that's a little bit true. And that's why I'm so grateful to the Atlantic for giving us this great platform to recruit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. There we go. Still, there is reason to be concerned about what happens to the extremists who already exist when a group is banned. The collective identity of R. The Donald was built around a shared fixation on external threats, mostly Muslims and leftists, according to a recent study. The us versus them attitude was requisite for feeling a sense of belonging there. After R. The Donald was banned from Reddit, another group of researchers looked at how this attitude fared on their new site, thedonald.win, and found that it was exacerbated. Um, is it okay if I skip the rest of this paragraph? I wanna, yeah, there's nothing really that specific people. there that this I disagree is, with. <laughs> okay, this isn't even about, this is about the Donald. Yeah. On over it, us versus them language is everywhere. They've been working for years now to censor and steer conversation on social media. One recent comment said, underneath a post that warned, be careful as they're setting traps for us. The they refers to outsiders back on Reddit. Over it may remain small, but the users who stay are spending more and more time talking about how they've been impressed by popular opinion on trans women's right to exist. As they spread out to, on a new site, on the new site, their entire discussion space is reserved for these feelings. Many of the top voted posts on the homepage are screenshots cherry picked from the outside world for ridicule or disdain. Their self-aware LMAO, one user wrote recently about a screenshot of a playful meme ostensibly made by a trans woman about the transition experience. Where are the links? Yeah, and I am so struck here hearing you reread it out loud at the generosity that's given towards the trans activists versus the uh, assumption of guilt that's given towards feminists here specifically the idea like that we're cherry picking okay well this whole article is cherry picked but you're allowed to do it and they cherry pick instances to try to make us look bad yeah. and, and you're citing all of their cherry picked instances in here as if it's somehow evidence of anything and 
extend the idea that, oh, well, their memes are playful and our memes are cruel. And it, I mean, look at, please look at the memes on some of the trans meme subreddits and compare them to the memes that are on, for example, the circle red femory, which is the meme one on over it. And really tell me like, like who you think is the hateful group there. Okay, and that's good advice because then you don't have to trust anybody else's cherry picked examples. Just go look for yourself. So exactly. I, I'm going to have all those links on my page, but okay. If you spend hours a day on this site, it would be easy to forget what the broader world is really like. Like forgetting that people know that men and women are different. Huh. It would be easy to forget what other people are really like too and to lose any curiosity about what they experience. Okay, I just want to say I actually found that line one of the most offensive lines in the whole article because it is such a misrepresentation of how someone ends up being gender critical or of the gender critical women that I know. I mean, I think for one, I'm an incredibly curious person. Um, curiosity is what brought me to this point and I remain incredibly curious. I do a lot, I spend a lot of time researching the things that I've come to believe. These are not opinions I have come to uh, without spending an enormous amount of time trying to satisfy my curiosity. Um, and I think it's also, pretty embarrassing considering the lack of curiosity to understand us that this article actually showed. Um, it, it just, it honestly feels like gaslighting be, to try to say what we feel while doing that actual thing and to say, like to try to tell us who we are, what we think and feel while then actually doing the exact thing yourself. Um, it, it's really nuts that that sort of thing it passes for journalism. Yeah, well, just to be fair to, to Tiffany, um, she did say it would be easy to forget. She didn't specifically say these people forget, but yes, that's the- That's, that's true. Underlying. Yes. Of course, it's all part of the framing that she's creating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely, it's, it's there. I just wanna be really fair to the words that she did because we are nitpicking her words. And so yeah, yeah, you're we're right. giving her full responsibility for everything she wrote. So we want to also make sure we're reading exactly what she wrote. And that's true. I, I do think that she was careful to not, except for in the few instances that were corrected, to not say things that were blatantly untrue, um, except for like the her use of adjectives. And I think the whole thing is an exercise in a strategic framing, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I mean, I read that the same way as you did. So I... As did everyone else. Like uh, people who are just skimming this article and passing on their morning commute, like they're all reading it, assuming that she's talking about us. Like you don't have to say yeah. these people are doing it for that to be what the reader takes away. And that's the, that's the goal. So, like there's no question about that. That's what she wanted to be taken away. Yeah. And if we do get, we're, we're going over an hour now, but if we end up looking at your emails after this, just... Mm -hmm you know, people keep in mind that line that Tiffany wrote that it's easy to, you know, to lose curiosity. You just keep it in the back of your mind that she's the one accusing other people of, of not having yeah. curiosity. Okay. After we spoke, I sent Fane a link to a thread on over it. Where is the link? Okay. In it's in my emails. <laughs> yeah. We're going to go look at it. We're going to go look at it in which women were discussed, but it's not here. No. Discussing their disdain for Transgender Day of Remembrance, an annual observance dedicated to the memory of people who were killed directly by anti-trans violence. In 2020, the number of deaths is at least 40 so far. How many fucking invented holidays do they have at this point? One asked. They should change it to every day as a trans day because they don't let us stop reading or hearing about them for even a minute, wrote another. I asked Fane if this kind of mocking angry speech was concerning to her at all, and she wrote back to say no. As I'm not a moderator on Over It, I don't feel I'm in the best position to comment on specific content, she said. More generally, though, I think humor and anger are both very common ways for people to deal with pain and oppression. Well, that yep. was it. That was the article. We did it. Good job. That was longer than I was remember it, it being. Was it painful? <laughs> no, actually, it was pretty funny. <laughs> Good. So, okay, let's just, let's just touch on these and then use that to connect to the email. Yeah, yeah, totally. 
So, so I, I mean, I think that the gist here is she manages to shoehorn this myth of the uh, greater threat posed to trans women of being murdered that and manages to shoehorn it in at the end to end on this note of like, oh, wow, look how they're making fun of violence. Um, what she doesn't mention, and I know I said I wasn't going to comment on specific content on over it to her, but I'll, I'll do it now since she dragged it through anyways, is uh I believe that the specific article that they were talking about was referencing a UK Trans Day of Remembrance in the United Kingdom. And because there are multiple for like each country has their own and then there's like an international one. So there are multiple Trans Days of Remembrance and the specific date was on the UK. And in the UK, we can thankfully say that no trans people were murdered in the previous year. And that is... Yeah, and on the day that we're like the period we're supposed to be remembering. And that's actually really excellent. Um, but the irony is that they continued to push this trans day of remembrance for all the murdered trans women when there were none. And um, I think it should instead have been some sort of celebration of the fact that no one of this group was murdered because no one should ever be murdered. And uh, of course, she left all of that out. She also left out the um, research that shows that people who identify as trans are actually less likely than either uh, women, like, well, than groups who identify as women or men who are not trans as a whole to be murdered. They're also less likely to be murdered than almost any significant demographic. And overwhelmingly, the trans women who are murdered are black people involved in the sex trade, which are two already incredibly risky demographics. And um, there, there's just no recognition of the actual statistics or of real violence, real male violence that goes into to these really tragic and avoidable deaths. And I think that that does a massive disservice to the uh, community actually, because you're totally erasing what the actual cause of this violence is. Hmm. But anyways, God forbid someone jokes about illogic. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, if people want to stop watching now, they might because we've been through the whole article. <laughs> but um, what, where do we even go from there? Let's look at the we, we probably don't need to go through like the whole thing line by line again. Yeah. Um, no. I, I guess probably the main takeaway that I would say from this is, so I do want to point to at the, towards the top of the post, I talk about, sorry, like if you scroll down a little to where the bullet points are. Yeah. So one, sorry, no, back up, like <laughs> above the, above where the email start right here. Yeah. Um, so something I think that's really important to note is that I was not intended at, from my perspective to be the main focus of this article it was supposed to be about over it as a, as a platform and she did interview these um, moderators or admins of over it and then completely left out their interviews and so um, I think I've given a good representation of what I think and feel about the site from you know just going through this line by line but if you're curious to know about what the actual people on over it are thinking the actual admins which of which I'm not then you should really read their interviews because I think that they are the people who were the most uh, erased in this whole process. Like I was mad that some of my answers were cut, but they were not even like it admitted that they existed in this article. Um, and it, that was really a shame. And so, especially when menopausal's uh, answers, I think are really eloquent and Girl and Dunn provides some really good facts about the site. So uh, those both I recommend checking out. Okay. And you know, I recommend people to read through the whole email exchange. This yeah. is blowing up. Glenn Greenwald retweeted this link today. Uh, yeah. We can probably start to wrap up since we've covered everything, mm -hmm. but what do you, how are you feeling now being the subject of so much attention? Uh, well, it's going better than I expected. <laughs> yeah, and we've, we've really gotten a lot of support. I think that the once I published the emails, it really became clear what a hack job this was, how much she had cut, how much she knowingly misrepresented. It's one thing to misunderstand, um, but through the emails, it became 
clear how much she really should have understood my point of view to the point where there was no excuse for her to do such a misrepresentation. And I think that that's what people are really responding to now is seeing how much detail I went into in these emails, how I, I even inc like cited my sources and my answers to her. You know, I, I link back to a lot of the uh, inspiration behind what I'm saying. I talk a lot about my background in activism. Um, I talk a lot about my motivations as a free software activist and about my um, training in Kingian and nonviolence and how that's inspired my free software activism specifically. And the glaring omissions of anything that could make me look like the left-wing radical that I am, but you know, to try to instead paint me as some sort of right-wing radical. Um, I think that that's what people are really responding to. And I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, the Atlantic did us a favor because this article was actually so bad that everyone could see through it. Um, and we're, yeah, so it, it's been interesting. I feel a little starstruck that Glenn Greenwald <laughs> retweeted my, my emails. Um, so I, it hasn't entirely sunk in yet. Um, I have not been actually getting as much hate as I expected, although I have my uh, Twitter filters very strict. So like you can only, I only get your notification under certain conditions. So I have not been seeing all the mean things people have said on Twitter. I'm sure they're there. I only got a few mean emails, but uh, overall it's actually been pretty positive. Yeah. Um, that reminded me though, we did want to show one of the links that Caitlin Tiffany had in her in her email that she then didn't use in the article mm. so she had she linked to you several things she said okay do you worry about at all about these about this mm -hmm. mocking and anger and then she this is the thread about trans remembrance day but there yeah. was another one which people can look you can go look and see if you find that hateful um now she linked to another thread in the emails that she didn't link to in the article. This one. Do you remember this? Yeah, yeah, I vaguely do. Now she emailed you this and she said, when I say hate speech, I'm talking about language. Okay. So uh, for example, in this thread, a trans woman is referred to as a creature. Did you look through this at all? Because I, I did not find the word creature. So I did. It's actually the very, very bottom comment that you might actually have to click like load more in order to get to it. Um, it it might not be the very bottom anymore, but uh, I did this it's yesterday. Not. I I, I oh, see more. Interesting. I wonder if it's actually this deleted one here. I wonder if the person deleted it after seeing that they oh, got mentioned the on article. the Atlantic. Yeah, because they. Uh, or in my article, I guess, because they might have been worried that it would okay. send people looking for this post and then send them looking through their post history and then lead to doxing and harassment. Okay. But the but point... I did see it. It was there. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and then the point is that, though, that was one word, again, cherry picking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, again, please, people, go read these threads. Go look at them. See what you think. Make up your own mind. Yeah, I mean, this was the worst thing that she could find on Over It, is someone calling someone a creature. I mean, yeah. and, like, women call their children creatures when they're acting badly. Like, I call my dog a noble creature sometimes. Yeah, and I don't think it's the nicest word to refer to someone, but to call it hate speech no. was such a stretch, such a stretch, that it was, it was shocking. Like, I honestly but even maybe expected it her. Was. I, I don't know what the comment said. But like it, you said, it was not like in the context, it was basically like, it was something along the lines of, I forget what the full context was, but it was like, oh, we're expected to see this creature as a woman or, or like something along um, those lines. Like it was, okay. it was saying this creature about that person. Okay. Um, but even still, like, it's not nice, yeah. <laughs> but it's also not hate speech. Like, well, it's... you were incredibly polite in your emails and friendly, but you did at one point say, you know, I think you're scrounging for ev for instances of what you call hate speech because you're not finding any, and that's very telling. Yeah, yeah, and I, 
I also, and this is why I think that we maybe shouldn't specifically target Caitlin as the um, bad person here, you know, if you can say such a thing, um, because, and this is something I said to her in my emails, is that I know that she actually could not report ethically on this. Like, she could not, because if she did, she would have been canceled. And, I mean, but we wait, saw this, for example. To, like, Right, she could. I'm sorry, I yes. interrupted you. Yeah. She, she, no, it's okay. Had a choice. I know where you, there was yeah, no you're gun right. to her head. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I would doubt that the article would be published. Like, mm-hmm. I I feel very confident that she, if, if she had done an accurate representation of radical feminism, the article would have been killed. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, you're right. There is no gun to her head. The, the choice is between probably uh, getting canceled, being fired, losing your entire social standing, uh, you know, depending on how much your job was important to your economics, uh, position, it could mean losing your house, not being able to pay rent. It could be losing your health care. you know, all things that happened to me when I was fired. Mm -hmm. And so I, I am sympathetic to the fact that she was in a very hard position. I think she did the wrong thing. And I think being in a hard position is not an excuse. You're right. She could have done the right thing as we both did, as many other people, women before us have done. Um, But I recognize that I think even if she was sympathetic, even if she did get it, I think that she probably would not have been allowed to publish that article. Yeah, very fair point. Very true. I mean, we know the silencing that's going on. Uh, there's also There are also some activists who try to get people dehomed in the sense that they call up their landlords. They go after them. Yeah. So, yeah, it's very real. Um, and they are allowed to be called leftist. <laughs> like, that is what is so shocking, is they are trying to get people kicked out of their housing. They're trying to make them unemployable. And they are called leftists. When leftists used to be the people trying to house the homeless and organize unions. <laughs> but... Yeah, but we're the alt-right, and they're the left, and the whole world is topsy-turvy. Yeah, I'm glad you, we can kind of end on that, like, the comparisons to the alt-right, I mean, or the far-right, right? So now, I'm not too mad, because it puts us in the same camp as Matthew McConaughey, so. (laughs) Is that true? I don't know anything about him. I think he just got accused. He said something moderate, which is obviously a sign that he's on the far-right, yeah. Yes, obviously a white supremacist. Okay, what do you want to leave us with today? Oh, (laughs) Um, I I guess my main takeaway of this is people can see through the bullshit when it hits a certain level. I think that we should not be afraid to engage in these conversations. If you can take the risk personally to put yourself out there and do that, you know, a lot of people were reaching out to me saying like, well, I'm so sorry this happened to you. I'm not sorry at all. This is this was great. This has raised a level of conversation that very few things have done. And I'm honestly really proud of Over It and all the women who have created Over It together with me to make this happen. Um, because I think that the conversation, it, it's impossible to be a logical, rational person and not end up at least sympathetic to our perspective and what's happening here. And so I think we should not be afraid to have this conversation, even when it's not on our terms, even if it means we're going to get trashed in national media, uh, because we are seeing, I think people are able to recognize it when it re- uh, reaches a certain level. Okay, fine. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me.